So before I get started here, I just want to let you know that next Sunday, we're going to be resuming a sermon series that we, we sort of began back in September. I told you it's one that we would revisit from time to time as we have time to do it, and that is the, the series called Hot Topics. It's that series where we're looking to the Bible for answers to some difficult questions that we have. And as you recall, over the last several weeks, uh, we've been asking you to submit your questions for us to consider uh, to, to cover over the next three weeks. And so uh, we, we received submissions and we, we prayed over those and narrowed them down to the following three. So next, next Sunday, February 9th, the question will be, can Jesus really change us? February 16th, the question is, and it's a long one because Pastor Aaron's preaching this one and he, he likes the long titles, but here's his title. Who is the real Jesus? Talking with Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, and skeptics about who Jesus claimed to be. So it should be a, a, very, a very good sermon on the, uh, understanding who Jesus is, a very uh, apologetics-oriented uh, message, and I'm looking forward to that. And then on the 23rd, the question is, how does the Bible address suicide? So those are some, some big questions coming up that we're going to do our best to, to look to the Bible to, to address. Uh, there are many other good ones that were sent in. Um, but these are the ones that we felt led to, to preach on. And so uh, thank you all of you for your submissions and your uh, requests. And I'm looking forward to diving into those uh, beginning next week. But before we do that, we have some business to, to, to finish with our current sermon series that we have called God's Economy. And this is a series that we've been diving into this idea of stewardship. Now, stewardship, as we've seen over the last several weeks, is about more than just how we handle our finances. Biblical stewardship, really, it, it teaches us that whether it is the things that God entrusts to us or whether it is even the things that God withholds from us. In all things, God desires that we come to know Him and enjoy Him and even entrust to Him all of our lives. You see, according to the Bible, our all of life works best when we order all of our relationships and all of our affections and all of our commodities after his own design. And so with that in mind, we're going to finish this series this morning with a sermon titled Ordered Work. Now, if you are a guest to us this morning, I hope that you feel like you are more than just a, a fly on the wall kind of listening in on, on our sermon series. I, I have a, a firm belief that, that God has a message for all of us this morning and we're going to look to his word to see what it has to say. And so if you would, if you have your Bibles, you'll see there in your bulletins, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. So I invite you to turn or, or tap there now. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, if you have a guest Bible, we're going to be on page 918. And I'm going to begin reading in verse 5 all the way down to verse 9. Here the Apostle Paul who writes, After all, who is Apollos? Who is Paul? We are only God's servants through whom you believed the good news. Each of us did the work the Lord gave us. I planted the seed in your hearts, and Apollos watered it. But it was God who made it grow. It's not important who does the planting or who does the watering. What's important is that God makes the seed grow. The one who plants and the one who waters work together with the same purpose, and both will be rewarded for their own hard work. For we are both God's workers, and you are God's field. You are God's building. Now, in Paul's day in which he was writing this, Corinth was the third largest city in the Roman Empire. And it was something like a virtual salad bowl of all sorts of diverse influences representing the whole world, both east and west. Roman law and religion, Greek philosophy and art, mystery cults from Egypt and across Asia, even some Judaism sprinkled in there. It was a, a hodgepodge, a mixture of all sorts of different things. And as a result, the church in many ways resembled the, the community. In its mixture of Jews and Gentiles and slaves and free people, rich and poor. And because of this great diversity, this young Christian community found itself struggling with various types of divisions and rivalries and tensions. 
So Paul composes this letter here, 1 Corinthians, to address those very things that are happening in this young Christian community. Now, it's interesting that 1 Corinthians is not Paul's first contact with the church in Corinth. It's actually his third. So his first contact would be his, his, what we've called his, his founding visit. It's when he visited Corinth for the first time and preached the good news and, and the church there was established. And then sometime after that, there was a second contact, which was in the form of a letter. A letter that this is, we call this one 1 Corinthians, that's in your Bibles, but it's actually the second letter he wrote to Corinth. And now we have his third contact here that we call 1 Corinthians that you have before you today. His third point of contact. And and in this third point of contact, he's going to address the, the news he has received about the quarreling and the jealousy and the rivalries and the divisions that have come to mark this community. And to do that, he does what every Every leader, Christian leader should do to address the exact same problems in every church that you find them in. He does it first by correcting bad theology, but then he does it by confronting a very shallow and immature spirituality. So we come to chapter 3, which is where we find ourselves this morning. And it's interesting, Paul begins chapter 3 by saying, hey, when I first came to you, I didn't give you the, the deep meat of the things of God. No, instead, I came and gave you sort of the basics. You weren't ready for, for the deep, heavy things. You, were, you could only stomach the, the very basic, light things. And so I fed you spiritual milk, like babies. That's all you could tolerate. But then you come to verse 2 here in chapter 3, and Paul says, well, based on the reports that I'm hearing, it sounds like that's all you can still handle. You're still not ready for the deeper things because you haven't yet resolved the, the, you haven't yet understood and, and imbibed those basic things that I gave to you. He says in, in verse 3 here, um, you are still controlled by your sinful nature. You are jealous of one another and quarrel with each other. Doesn't that prove you're controlled by your sinful nature? Aren't you living like people of the world? When one of you says, I am a follower of Paul, and another says, I follow Apollos. Aren't you acting just like the people of the world? It would seem from our, our reading and our, our, our thinking uh, into the context of, of the church in Corinth, it would seem that factions had begun to develop there that were uh, centered around which Christian leader the different groups of people preferred. I don't know if all of you remember this, but about 10 years ago, there was a movie that came out called New Moon. I expected that to get some chuckles from those who know what I'm talking about. It was part of the Twilight series. Remember the, the vampire love story? Yeah, it was all the rage back 10 years ago. And, and the second installment of the movies came out, and it was called New Moon. And in that movie, our female teenage protagonist, Bella, found herself in quite a pickle. Because basically she found herself with feelings for two different men. And so, as a result of that, all the, 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 the teenage girls who were all into the series began dividing themselves into factions based on which guy they thought Bella should choose. So you had, on this side, Team Edward, and they thought Edward was the one that Bella should choose. And on this side, you had Team Jacob. And it was all the thing. Which, which team are you? Now, that's a little bit of nostalgia for those of you who 10 years ago were teenage girls and, and into Twilight, and maybe even now some of you still are. I don't know. But that's kind of like what's happening in Corinth. This very juvenile, immature, shallow way of, of organizing themselves based on which Christian leader they, they preferred. I'm team Paul. No, I'm team Apollos. And here they found themselves forming what has come to be called personality cults, groups that, that, that organize themselves against one another based on the person that they have chosen. And Paul says, the fact that you view your leadership in this way, the fact that your church is divided over something as shallow and as petty as this, demonstrates how little that you understand the nature of the church and what the work of God in the world is all about. You're still not ready, Paul says. Who, after all, is Apollos? 
Who is Paul? In fact, literally, the, the, in the Greek it says, what is Paul? What is Apollos? He doesn't even dignify the, the, the people in the question with, with, with a, a personal way of asking. It's very impersonal. It's, it's as if he's trying to diffuse the whole situation here by diminishing the importance of the individual persons. Who are we, Paul says? We're, we're, just, we're nothing more than servants here. The word for servant is that word that we get deacon from. It's, it's, it's a servant that's really not, not has no higher place than a, someone waiting on a table. We're just servers here. We're, we're nothing. God is the one who gives us the instructions. We go and do what he says, and we're nothing more than that, and we're nothing less than that. That's interesting. Paul's paradigm of Christian leadership, this, this idea of, of sacrificial servanthood, it's, well, it comes straight from the mouth of Jesus himself. Jesus, who, as you recall back in Luke chapter 22, says, In the world the kings and great men lord it over their people, yet they are called friends of the people. But among you, he's speaking to his disciples here, the the future leaders of the church, but among you it will be different. And I think by extension he speaks to all of us here when he says, Those who who are the greatest among you should take the lowest rank. And the leader should be like a servant. Who is more important? The one who sits at the table or the one who serves? The one who sits at the table, of course, but not here. Not here. Not at the Lord's table. The Lord's table, Jesus says, I am among you as one who serves. It's interesting, isn't it? Paul says, if Jesus led in this way, if Jesus was a servant, well, we are too. We're nothing greater than our master. And division and rivalry and jealousy will always arise when the church gets that all wrong. Recently, a a very generous couple here at our church who who, uh, recently became members um, donated brand new carpet to a number of the rooms next in the building next door. You may recall us mentioning that before. One of those rooms that received new carpet was my office. And I love my new carpet. It's beautiful. And, and you may recall the carpet I had in there before. Now, when I first, when I first came here as, uh, six year, over six years ago um, as a, a candidate as, uh, for a potential position here on the staff, um, Pastor Bill at the time, we were walking around the building and he was showing me around and he says, hey, um, of all these empty offices here or rooms, is there one that if you come, is there one you'd like to be your office? And so I, I picked, of course, the, 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 <laughs> the one closest to the restrooms. And, and it at the time, if, for those of you who were around then, it was a computer lab at the time. There were computers on the walls and the floor, I believe, was still tile. And, um, but I saw it as a, a, a space that I could feel very at home in. And, and so uh, a number of weeks later, after, after the church voted me in and I uprooted my family, we moved here to North Carolina, that was my office. And when I walked in for the first time, uh, you had carpeted it, it carpeted it. And it's, it was nice carpet. And I've always appreciated that carpet. It, it, it could have been tile. And so I was grateful for it, but I always had a problem with it. And I'll tell you why. It wasn't that the quality was bad. It's, it was so purple. <laughs> now, purple's great. I love purple. And, and it's not that I, you know, I'm too macho of a, of, a, of a man to have purple carpet. That's not it at all. For me, it was a, a symbolic problem. I always resented my purple carpet because in so many ways, it, it just looked too royal, too regal. And I don't know about you, but I find few things more repulsive than the the king pastor. You know the one I'm talking about? The self-important, egotistical leader who, who controls everything and demands their way and rules over all with an iron fist. 
The type of leader who, who's not about building a kingdom that belongs to God, but a kingdom that, that belongs to himself. Complete with, with statues and, and tributes and memorials to his own greatness and his own accomplishments. A one who, who builds a kingdom that, that is such that his part in it is indispensable. Listen, that's, that's not the example of Jesus that he leaves for Christian leaders. Jesus, whose whole life on earth as a model for us was marked not by superiority or, or ego, but humility and self-giving love. Who was a king and is a king and the king of all kings, but his time of being lifted up on this earth was not to be placed onto a throne, but to be hung upon a cross. The Lord over all lords who in a, a tremendous act that was forever embedded and in, in, enshrined in the memories and consciousness of his, of his disciples, this act of service, he, the Lord of lords takes up, up a towel and a basin and cleans their feet in a supreme act of, of, of service, about as low as it, as it gets. Have you ever cleaned another person's feet? Oof. That's rough business. I've, I've been a part of a foot washing service before, and I was cleaning the feet of someone who probably had just had a, a shower in the last 24 hours and was wearing you know, shoes and socks. I've, I've never washed the feet of someone who, who walked around in sandals and in dirty, dusty, you know, first century world where, where animals and probably people use the street as the bathroom, and that's disgusting. And here's the Lord of all lords taking up that as his business. The good shepherd who never fleeced his sheep, but instead gave his life for his sheep. The son of man who came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. True leadership in the kingdom of God, according to God's ordering of things is found in the laying down of one's life in the service of another. In any other paradigm of leadership, any other paradigm of authority in the church is to be rejected. What then, Paul is saying, is Apollo? You, you, you have elevated him. You have elevated me to this place that we don't deserve. We don't belong in this position you have placed us in. What is Apollos? What is Paul? What is entered the, the name of your pastor or the, your favorite Christian leader? What is any, what are you? What, what am I? Christ-like leaders, Christians in general, none of us are to be despots. No, we are to be servants. And Paul, Paul has to start right there. Paul has to start right there in addressing the divisions and the quarrels and the rivalries that came to define the church in Corinth. How they view leadership, how they view authority, how they view the various roles that God has assigned in the ordering of his church. So here you have Paul, who is arguably the second, third most important person in the history of the world. I mean, you have, you have Jesus, and then Paul, or maybe Moses. I don't even know who number three is. Maybe, maybe Truett Cathy, I mean, the guy that gave us Chick-fil-A. Maybe he's the, the fourth most important person in the history of the world. I don't know. But here's Paul, arguably the second or third most important person in the world, and he says, very simply in verse 6, I planted, Apollos watered. Not, I planted, Apollos watered, but I planted, Apollos watered. Both, both of what we did is vital. And both of what we did is dependent. I mean, think about it. What good is it to, to plant a seed if no one is going to come and water the seed? And what good is, is watering the ground when it's not the ground where the seed has been planted? Look again in verses 6 and 7 here what Paul says. I planted the seed in your hearts, and Apollos watered it. But guess what? It was God who made it grow. 
It's not important, therefore, who does the planting. It's not important who does the watering. What's important is that it is God who makes the seed grow. In other words, my work was important, Apollos' work was important, but all of our work was useless unless God came and did what only He can do. And this means, among a lot of things, but this means at least, if nothing else, that God calls His people to do some things, but there are some things that God does not call His people to do. Some of the work is ours to do. God, God in His economy, gives out work for His people to do on the earth, but there's some things that God does not give us to do. For example, you and I are all called as Christians. If you are a Christian here this morning, you are called to go into the world and bear witness to what to who God is, who Christ is, and what God by His Spirit has done in your life. You are called to go and testify to the world. But you are not called to change a person's heart. You are not called, you cannot save anybody. You cannot transform a person's life. We sang this morning about shackles being broken and us being delivered from bondage. You do not have the power in yourself to do any of that. That power belongs to God. So there's work that he gives us to do, and there's work that he does not give us to do. And I don't, I don't know about you, but, but I, really, I really appreciate understanding that. Because not only does that give us those healthy, healthy boundaries about where, where we are to work and, and what we are not to do, but it also relieves a tremendous amount of pressure. It is a, it is a, a tremendous relief of pressure to know that it is not up to me to change anyone's minds or hearts in here this morning. It is only up to me in the particular role that God has given me to, to faithfully proclaim his word to his people. But I can't change any one of you. I can't, I can't make you turn away from sin. I, I can't transform your heart. I can't reorder your affections. That's the work that belongs to God. It's not up to me to do what only he can do. And I've, I feel like too many Christians, whether you are a, a a lay person or a, a professional trained clergy person, too many Christians have either burnt themselves out because they're trying to do more than what it was theirs to do, or you have placed yourself on the sidelines and haven't done a thing because of you, you had this unhealthy perspective of what God is actually calling us to be in the world. This unhealthy view of God's work and what he has ordered for his people to be in do. Yes, Paul says in verse 9, we are, and it says literally, we are literally God's fellow workers. He invites us to come and and yoke ourselves to him. This this instrument of labor and work, we are to place ourselves under his yoke. Pastor Aaron prayed about it this morning. We We conjoin ourselves to what God is doing in the world, but there are very clear distinctions between what belongs to him and what belongs to us. And by the way, there are very clear distinctions between what belongs to each of us to do. I mean, God's work is not mine to do. (laughs) Thanks be to him for that. But guess what else? Your work is not for me to do. And my work is not for you to do. There's not only this great distinction between our collective work and the work of God, but there's a great distinction between what each of, of us are assigned to do. We're not all assigned the same job, the same role. Paul loves the, the body metaphor. You, if you flip forward in your, in your Bibles to the 12th chapter of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, you'll see that Paul takes the human body and uses it as sort of a living metaphor of what the body of Christ is actually like. So every one of us here today, we are a, a one person with a body. And your body is not just one member, is it? It's made up of many members. And all the members are part of the body. And, and all the members work together for the body. And all the, all the members are essential in, in their own respective ways. I mean, who of you in here can, can eat a bowl of cereal with your foot? Now, there are some people who lose their hands. and Okay, that's different. And they learn to do amazing things with their toes. I've seen even videos of people playing the piano with their toes. Jeff, I expect that next Sunday. I want to see some, t- some toe, toe piano playing. But seriously, I mean, th- there's certain parts of your body that, that can perform certain things, and they are the only parts that can do those things. body needs all of the members to be working. And Paul says, in the same way is the body of Christ. One body, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God but many members. 
many parts. And he says in verse 18 of that chapter, God has put each part just where he wants it. God is the one who was putting this thing together. He's the one building this structure. He's the one that, that this field belongs to. He's causing it to grow in just the way that he wants it to grow. He wants it to work and function and operate in the world exactly as he has designed it to. But all the members have to work together. Paul and Apollos each had a different role, a different part to play. But he says back in chapter 3, verse 8, but we shared the same purpose. It wasn't our purpose. It wasn't, I'll tell you, that's a recipe for disaster in a church when, when one person comes in with their agenda and another person comes in with their agenda. I mean, some of you may have had an experience in a church like that once upon a time where the, the, the church life was defined by factions and groups and everyone had a different agenda. Everyone had a different purpose. And Paul says, no, in the body of Christ, we are to have one objective, one purpose, and it doesn't belong to any one of us. It belongs to God. And that purpose is to plant God's field, to build God's structure, to do the work that God assigns for us to do. And God will then reward those who do it. Now, what's the effect of all this? What, is the, what are we as, as we look at this and, and we put ourselves in the shoes of those first century Christians and we, we place ourselves in their context and we, we begin to process what all this means, what is the effect that Paul wants to have in saying these things? Well, by my reading, it, it does a couple of things. First, it, it diminishes the centrality of the individual. It's not about me, Paul said. It's not about him. And though it diminishes the centrality of the individual, it does not diminish the importance of their contribution or their work. I love that balance. Paul says, by looking at me or Apollos, you're focusing on the wrong person. We are only servants of God. We're just waiting on the tables that he assigns us. And yet, he can equally say in verse 5 that it was through their ministry, it was through their work that the Corinthians came to believe the good news. So while they diminish the, the importance and the centrality of them as individuals, they never diminish the work that God is doing through them. Their work was vital to the divine scheme of things. But why? It's not because they were irreplaceable or because God needed them in some way. No, their work was vital because God chose them for that. And that, listen friends, that is a huge distinction that you and I have to have as we think about ordered work, as we think about the things that God has for every one of us to do in his great plan and purpose for the world. That should evoke immense humility on all of our behalves, that, you, that God does not need us. But at the same time, it imparts tremendous dignity to the work that you and I have to do. All of us are replaceable. And listen, any effort that you and I undertake, however big or small, as we think about our part to play in, the, in God's, God's work here at this church and in the world, any effort that you and I undertake to build our own little kingdom, this thing that we possess and control and are indispensable to, listen, that's not only sinful, that is delusional. All of us are dispensable. All of us are replaceable. And yet... The inescapable and undeniable truth is this. It is that God desires to use people to accomplish his purposes in the world. God still wants to use us. It, it gives him delight. He has ordered his world in such a way that he uses people to do his things. And that means every single person, every person here, every person here is invited to engage in work that has eternal value. To be about the things of God. I don't know about you, but that sounds to me like this tremendous honor. It's a privilege to say, yes, God created man from the beginning, before there was ever sin in the world, to work in, ex in expanding his glory upon the earth. And that that invitation has not changed. I still have, you still have this 
this invitation to step into what God has, has invited us to do in the world for him. He still has work for us to do. And this is not just an invitation to, to elders or, or apostles or trained, ordained, professional clergy. This is an invitation for all who would come to him and, and find their identity in Christ. Towards the very end of this letter, all the way in chapter 15, Paul says at the very end of that chapter, So my dear brothers and sisters, be strong, be immovable, be resolute, always work enthusiastically for the Lord. For you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. Wow. Listen, as a man, that really resonates in me to my core. To know that I can actually spend and be spent in work that is not empty. Work that for the Lord that is never done in vain. And if you belong to Christ, you are not only a servant to Christ, but you are a member of his body and he has something for you to do that really matters. Something that has value that endures. Work that comes from the Lord. Work that can be done in his mighty power and his strength. Work that will only ever result in his glory and in his honor forever. No, God does not need you. God does not need me, but oh, how he desires. Oh, how he desires to use you and to use me. You and I should therefore, as Paul says, enthusiastically give ourselves to the work he has for us. Work for him, leaving the results in the glory to him. As he also says in chapter 15, I have worked harder than any of the other apostles, yet it was not I, but it was God who was working through me by his grace. For whatever I am, it is only ever because God poured out his special favor on me. Yes, I planted. Yes, Apollos watered. But it was God who gave the growth. And it is to God that all glory is due. So friends, you and I have work to do. We have work to do today. No matter your age, no matter your station in life, God wants to use you to accomplish things for him that matter for eternity. Now, if you are not a Christian this morning, if you are not a member of the body of Christ, as we have already been talking about today, your first order of business as you are listening to the proclamation of his word is to give your heart to Jesus. Last week I was talking about how we use our time and how we use our money and how we understand God's particular will for our lives and what we are to do in the world and, and, and all those things. And what I said then, is I'll, I'll reiterate today, you cannot know the what of all that God has for you until you first know the who. You will never know who you are. You will never know what God has for you to do until you first come to know the one you were created for. And there is no meaningful work of consequence for you to do in this world that will last forever outside of a love relationship with God. That is the very thing that you were created for at the ground level to know him and to enjoy him and to multiply his goodness and in his glory to all the world. God's purposes for people at the very beginning continue today. God wants you to know him in a saving way and you'll never begin to know his purpose for your life until you begin to know him personally. And sin stands between you and him. Your rebellion, your wickedness, your waywardness, your decision to live for yourself and for your own glory and for your own kingdom has stood between you and a personal relationship with the God who created you and the God who loves you and the God who sent his son to die for you. And he's offering you a chance to have the slate wiped clean, to start fresh today. No matter how old you are or how many terrible things that you've done or how dirty you feel inside, the invitation is for you to come and receive this free gift of life 
that never ends. I'll baptize you next week. I'll do it. I promise. If you only give your heart to Jesus today. If you come to him and say, look, I don't understand all these things. I don't know what it all means. But I know this. I am wicked in my core. And on my own, I I am capable of nothing good that lasts forever. And I reject my own efforts to give meaning and value and purpose in life to myself. That's called repentance. I turn away from my sin. I turn away from my self-sufficiency. I turn away from, from finding everything in myself, and I turn to you, Jesus. And I, and I trust you to save me, to give life to me, to be Lord over me. And in an instant, in an instant, by the power of God's Holy Spirit, you can be born again to an altogether new life that will never, ever end. Listen, don't waste another second of your life living for anything or anyone else than him. The heart, the heart is restless until it finds its rest in thee. Now for Christians, Paul says in verse 9, you and I are God's building. You and I are that structure, that place on the earth in which his glory and his life and his work dwells in the world. We are God's household. And as such, it is in God's economy to distribute himself to us in order to possess him and enjoy him, but never to hoard him. It is not his economy for us to to hoard him to ourselves as stewards. On the contrary, as stewards, we are to be right administrators of everything he has entrusted to us. Our life, our time, our money, our work, even our possession of and enjoyment of him. The church, as the embodiment of God's life and work in the world, is to be enjoyed, yes, but it is also to be shared And each of us has a part to play. But none of our work is to be done in our own power. It is not to be done for our own glory. We are simply invited to join God in his worldwide redemptive movement. Faithfully doing that which he himself has assigned for every individual and every church and every Christian community to do. As an obedient witness to his sovereignty and goodness in the world. Entrusting all of our lives to Jesus who gave all of his life for us. May this be a church that is resolved to work together in him to accomplish things that truly matter. On February 16th of this, uh, February 26th of this month, uh, it'll be Ash Wednesday it's that, 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 that date on the calendar that we, we circle every year as the start of the season of Lent, which leads up to and prepares our hearts for Easter. So that Wednesday is February 26th, and that Wednesday has special significance to me this year because this year, it, that day will be the, the third anniversary of my father's passing. Many of you remember that because you were here and walked with my family um, along with me through that as we processed the losing dad. Um, you know, when, when dad passed away, a number of his possessions got passed down to my siblings and, and me. And one of those things that I received uh, was his computer, his laptop. And um, that computer sat in a bag for a long time before I, I ever opened it. I just couldn't bring myself to. I don't know why. I just It was too personal. It was too... Uh, it meant too much. You know, I, when I finally took that, about a year later, I think, I opened it up and <laughs> there were still smudges and fingerprints and, and whiskers and spilled drinks and things, residue, artifacts of dad's life uh, sitting on the keyboard. It was actually a lot to clean up, but, um, but it was there and it, it was dad and it was, it was a special time for me to, to go through that. And, 
And, and my, my goal was to take that and to clean it up and to get it in, in proper working order. And, and part of that involved, you know, removing things that didn't, didn't need to be on the computer anymore and, and saving the things that, that needed to be saved. Well, for, uh, for his career, my dad was what is called a registered communications distributions designer. The acronym is RCDD. Some of you may know what that is, but most of you, I dare say, don't. An RCDD is basically a professional who was highly certified to, to design large, complex cable systems. So dad was basically a, a network infrastructure engineer. So if there was a, for example, one of his last projects was uh, a, a, a huge um, hospital network in central Ohio was redoing all of their data and phone systems, everything, like tearing out all the old and putting in all the new. And I'm not talking about little hospitals like we have in here at, at Albemarle. I'm talking about massive massive hospital systems. And dad came in and he was one of the engineers that helped design all the, all the infrastructure that was going back in. Huge, huge project. Dad was, was brilliant and successful and experienced. And on his laptop, I found countless gigabytes of old project files. Stuff that you needed a Rosetta Stone to translate and understand what any of it was. I mean, there's, there's a very tiny handful of people in the world who could, who could look at that work and have the slightest clue what any of it meant or how to use it. And, and it occurred to me as I was looking through all these old project files that Dad gave decades of his life to this. Decades. Countless days and nights and weekends and hours spent designing and thinking and troubleshooting. And, and yet here all these files sit on a forgotten laptop never to be needed or used again, ever. And then I remembered a story from his final week of life at the end of a very long season of suffering and decline. Dad suffered from diabetes for half, almost his whole adult life, and in it, towards the end of his life, he suffered from uh, very debilitating back problems. He had four major and unsuccessful back surgeries. Dad had four heart attacks. He had a stroke. Dad uh, eventually passed away from liver failure. It was, it was a very uh, difficult season. And, and in his last uh, days, um, as his consciousness was fading, uh, Dad's, Dad's fight against suffering was, was coming to an end. And his brother, Tom, uh, Dad was a... Uh, Dad had four siblings, and he was the oldest, and the next oldest was his brother, Tom. Tom lived out of town, and Tom had come in to see uh, my father one more time, and, and my brother tells a story of how Tom walks out of that room there at the hospice facility where he was staying with tears in his eyes, and he's just shaking his head in disbelief, and he said, I came to see how he was doing on his deathbed. But all he wanted to talk about was my life, my struggles, my issues. He asked to pray for me. <laughs> Uncle Tom says, who does that? Who does that? Who on their deathbed cares about everyone else? Now listen, I would never dream of suggesting that my dad's work as an RCD, RCDD didn't matter. It mattered tremendously, especially to me as his child who benefited from his long hours of work and the quality of life that he provided for my family and me. And I'll be forever grateful for the, what he modeled and taught me about the value and dignity of hard work. And it is true that Every area of industry needs dedicated, surrendered, Christian people, salt and light for the world, who are bearing witness in every, in every workplace, in every corner of the world. The world needs that. But it wasn't Dad's network designs that had eternal value. It was his efforts to testify to the matchless love of God in Christ to people, to people, even to the very end of his life, this side of heaven. Friends, what can you be doing today to accomplish something like that for Jesus? 
What can you do today? Not in your own power or for your own glory or for your name to to be spread and people to care about who you are. What can you be doing today in Christ's strength and for Christ's glory that will make an impact on someone's life for all of eternity? Just imagine what could happen at your home, in your house, in your family. Imagine what could happen on the street out here. Imagine what could happen in this community or, or in this region if every person here who is a member of the body of Christ allowed God to order all of our work together. No divisions, no rivalries, No petty, superficial bickering or quarreling, but every member playing their part together in him. Only heaven will ever be able to quantify the magnitude of the impact that we could have together. So let us resolve this day to be faithful stewards of all that we are, all that we have, and all that we do. Let us pray. Lord, days like today are, are, are indeed causes for great celebration. We, we love our preschool and we love our preschool families and the kids. And it is such a joy to, to come together in this unique way and worship and, and celebrate who you are and all that you've done and, and to, to share a, a, a meal of fellowship together. Lord, what a, what a gift, and we thank you for today. But I hope that none of us leave here today with, with nothing more than a, a stomach full of soup. Lord, my prayer is that every person here would leave with a life full of meaning. A mind and heart filled with direction for what we need to be about in this world for you. Lord, if there's anybody here this morning who has not given their life to you, I pray that they would swallow their pride or their fear or their rebellion, whatever it is that that they're clinging to, and they would just say yes to you and experience the life and the joy and the peace and the purpose that you so desperately want them to have. Lord, release them Free them to to come to me if they have questions. And I will walk with them through that that process without any judgment or looking down on, on them in any way. Lord, do a work of salvation in someone's heart today. And for the rest of us, I pray that we would be resolved to to be to spend and be spent in work for you. In every area of life we find ourselves in, Lord, fill it all with purpose. Give us direction and give us power by your spirit to accomplish the work you have assigned us to do for your glory and for the building of your kingdom. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.